Hey there. Now, I'm no stranger to taking on projects beyond my capabilities, and today is business as usual. One of the best things about not knowing your own limits is the frantic game of catch up in both knowledge and on the topic of this adventure, equipment. If it wasn't obvious, I'm going to need a bigger steady rest so that this lathe has the slightest chance of putting a precision bore in the end of this ridiculous chunk of hollow bar. It's not often I come across the perfect piece of material for a project, so you can imagine my excitement at finding this old jig I'd made for bending up a pretty big brass ring. Okay, maybe it's not the perfect piece of material. I'm sure I'm not alone when I say I could always do with a little more width. Right guys? But you work with what you've got. And if you never get started, you'll never get finished. Based around the size of that ring, my design calls for three slotted fingers with a socket on the end to accept interchangeable bearing pads. I've heard conflicting ideas about the best kind of material for plane bearings in this application, so I'd like to be able to experiment. It'll also allow me to have different pads for different shapes, like squares and triangles. I'm still getting a feel for what sort of feeds and speeds I can get away with in mild steel, so I ran a single finger to start off with. This is always a good idea, as it lets you work out any kinks in your program. After the first part, I felt like I could increase the step over a little, so I made some adjustments to the toolpath and ran the other two fingers. Then I flipped the parts and started off two. I'm pretty amazed at how much material this roughing end mill can remove. Unfortunately, during the finishing pass I discovered it hadn't removed quite enough, and this 6mm end mill tried to pick up the slack. After making some more small adjustments in cam, I finished machining the fingers. There were a few burrs and the surface finish on the curved chamfers wasn't great, but as with many things in life, the solution turned out to be as simple as a quick rub. Moving on to the ring, I encountered a familiar set of fixturing challenges. You see, I need to machine all these features, and all I really have in the way of clamping hardware is a few 123 blocks and these scrap parts with a convenient 10mm hole. You know, I'm really starting to wish I'd put T slots on this table. Anyway, I got through it like I always do, by wasting a ridiculous amount of time, instead of pausing for a second to solve the underlying issue. I machined the inside bore first, then relocated the bottom setup block to get to the top and outside features.
Now, I know there's at least a few of you watching this who'd love to be able to carve up steel on machine tools of your own someday. And I know it can be a little disheartening to see me or any other maker on YouTube with a huge catalogue of tools and equipment. And you know, I was in the same boat. But this hobby of artificing, now something I'm lucky enough to do every single day, has a great tendency to snowball. That doesn't happen overnight. But like I said, if you never get started, you'll never get finished. I've been chasing the dream of making anything and everything for most of my short life. And it's really only recently I've managed to get set up in the way you've seen so far. So if it's something you really want, start simple, but start now. Get yourself a project just outside of your comfort zone, a project that might need one or two new tools, and just start. In a few years time, who knows where you might be. I made sure to break at least one end mill, which ended up being a blessing in disguise. You see, I had the height set too low, so had it survived, that cutter would have scrapped this part. I chamfered some edges, tapped some holes, and did the obligatory slidey slidey, twisty twisty. Things were looking good. Now, I know this isn't the most exciting project, but even a real engineer will tell you, the big stuff takes time. So if you don't want to miss out, make sure you subscribe. And if you want to get a sneak peek of what's coming up and help speed up the process by supporting the channel on Patreon, who am I to stop you? This connecting plate was next, quickly followed by the emptying of my large intestines. shit. <laughs> nice. On the plus side, this incident opened my eyes to how little I was sending it. Well, I wasn't complaining. So once again I upped the step over. The way I see it, if you're not having to put on fresh undies semi-regularly, you're not growing. I was beyond impressed with how well it handled this cut, at least until I was looking back over this footage, and I noticed the tool holder pulling out of the spindle, as if I didn't already have enough trouble sleeping at night.
The next part was a simple one with just a flat face, a hole in the center, and a relief matching the profile of the lathe's bedways. Now, because the lathe I'm fitting this to is on the other side of town, I left a little extra meat on the flat so I could make fine adjustments to properly fit it later. Moving on to the pads, I could have avoided a lot of frustration if I'd simply made this radius slightly bigger. As it was, I'd need a 4mm end mill to match it to the profile of the fingers. And because I'm lazy and hate tool changes, I decided to do the roughing with the same 4mm end mill. I also somehow reached the conclusion that a single clamp, accompanied by a little bit of masking tape and some super glue, would be totally fine and completely adequate fixturing. I broke almost every 4mm tool I had before I realised it was moving around and I decided I had to change my approach. Once I decided to extract the parts from the end of some bar stock, things went a lot smoother and these pads ended up being a really nice tight fit. Of course, in retrospect, the idea of interchangeable pads was a waste of time because I really never want to have to make another set of these. And with that, I was ready to head into the workshop and weld everything up. As expected, the base didn't quite match the bedways, but after a quick tickle on the manual mill, I got it close enough. The leftover bits of silicon bronze spatter were bothering me a bit. After quickly copying the cast clamping plate, I set everything up on the lathe ready for welding. Tacking everything up in position will hopefully ensure the ring is nicely aligned with the spindle. I made sure the work clamp had good contact to both parts being welded to try to eliminate the risk of current running through the spindle bearings and added a bunch of beefy tacks. To prevent putting too much heat into the bedways, and so I could actually see what I was doing, I finished the welding off the lathe. Despite probably putting a bit too much heat in, it didn't seem like it had developed any distortion, so it was time to give it a test. Unfortunately this stock is the furthest thing from round, so I had to turn a section for the steady rest to support. Fortunately, it makes a great demonstration of why this thing is even necessary. At least it will for people who see this and think to themselves, that looks all right. And with the new steady, what a sight to behold. Now all I need is a real boring bar, maybe an ID lap and a tool post grinder. And I can't forget about strap clamps and probably a heat treating oven.